Howard Prager, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thanks, Howie. So pleased to be here. Yeah, so you're one of like my favorite people that I've never met and don't really know. <laughs> just, just uh, you know, your your writing, um, your personality, the things you post on Facebook is sort of like relentlessly optimistic, positive, upbeat, helpful. And it feels like that's kind of who you are, like you're not stunting for social media. So I'm really happy to be in connection with you. Oh, thank you. Well, we're going to take care of getting to know each other now and look forward to meeting in person, hopefully sometime this year. Yeah, that would that is that is something that, uh, you know, with COVID and stars and all sorts of things aligning would be very, very wonderful. Yes. Um, First, let, let's like tell tell me and, and the audience like a little bit about who you are, where you come from, just some, you know, background. Sure. Thanks, Howie. Well, I live in the Chicago area, first and foremost. So uh, I was listening to your previous podcast on, on ice baths and cold showers, and I'm thinking I just need to open the front door. That's all I need to do. But, uh, <laughs> but it was really, really good, and I uh, have enjoyed the Chicago area, other than some of this winter weather. Uh, it's a beautiful place, and both culturally and, and academically and socially, uh, it's, a, it's a nice part of the country. And I think that kind of reflects a little bit about who I am and my spirit and outlook. You know, I dedicated this book, uh, Make Someone's Day, to, uh, to my parents and my grandmother, because they all exhibited incredible kindness towards others, especially towards strangers. And I realized strangers and, and others who maybe you wouldn't necessarily expect to be extending kindness to. Uh, my dad was always looking out for ways to help others, whether it's the custodian in his office or someone he runs into. Uh, he, he was a great one for being able to help lift others up. And I guess it just passed on to me. So that's who I am. Uh, and you, as you say, it comes naturally. And when the idea came for me for the book, Make Someone Stay, as I started writing it, I started realizing this is how I live my life. As, and my friend said, Howard, this is perfect for you. So I can we can get into that much more. And I look forward to sharing a, a number of ideas and stories with your listeners so that they too can go out and start the year right by making someone's day. Mm. Yeah. And as you're talking about, you know, your, your father and your grandmother, like this idea of like kindness towards strangers and these opportunities, what's coming to me is, you know, we're in year two, you're entering year three of the pandemic. I have felt like intellectually, like pretty inured, like pretty lucky. Like I don't work in a situation. I don't live like I was, you know, sort of on a farm here doing most of my work is possible to do remotely. Um, that I didn't feel like my life was affected that much. But lately, I've really sort of slowed down and noticed how just damn sad I am so much of the time and how many things that I used to do, I don't do anymore. And it, you know, it's just kind of a feeling of like low grade depression. And as I hear you talking, like I'm here, I'm feeling like that's, that's sort of an antidote, like going out and being kind to other people is kind of a rush. Like, forget about like any moral or ethical qualities or religious or spiritual values, but just doing nice things for other people when it's not required and when it's a little bit creative and spontaneous and surprising, like I feel like juice returning to my soul. Yes, yes. No, you're absolutely right. It is a way of really uplifting not only others, but yourself in spirit. So I'm going to start off. I tried to identify what might be some passages from the book that I'd like to share with our listeners. So this is from um, the uh, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General Hospital and also a Harvard associate professor, Gregory Friccioni. So he's working on a book about brain evolution and the development of human altruism. And he said, and I quote, if it is evolutionary beneficial for human beings to benefit from social support, 
you would expect that evolution would provide the species with a capacity to provide social support, he says. This is where the human capacity for altruism may come from. So indeed, in my words, oxytocin may be connected to both physical and emotional well-being. And oxytocin, as Frichioni says, is the mediator of what has been called the tend-mend response as opposed to the fight-flight response to stress. When you're altruistic and touching people in a positive way, lending a helping hand, or in my words, making someone's day, your oxytocin level goes up and that relieves your own stress. Uh, there's so many psychological, emotional, and physical reasons to reduce stress and help others by making someone's day. Mm, that's that's so beautiful. And it's so different from what I learned, you know, 20, 30 years ago about like Darwinian evolution and the imperatives for selfishness. I think when, when we think of Darwin, and I've, I've loved Darwin all my life and studied him, and, and we think about, you know, the survival of the fittest, right? And so it's a it's a doggy dog type of world. Well, it's not necessarily a doggy dog type of world. I don't think he's saying that you have to go out and, and push your way through the morass to, to make a difference and to survive. And I think we've learned is 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 humans that it's so much better and stronger when we have supporters and others that we can and others that we can support and that truly is the way that i think we're going to continue to grow and evolve um, i hate to say this but as a species as, as humankind we're going to grow that way um, through greater support and you and i have have friends who are helping that support uh, come uh, through AI and VR and other ways. So it's going to be through people and technology, and it's going to help us uh, maybe evolve to a higher level. Nice, nice. I, I don't know if you, I don't know if you're a Jack Handy fan from uh, Saturday Night Live. Oh yes, <laughs> I remember him saying that you know, look at the word mankind. It's made up of two words, mank and end, and we have no idea what either of them means. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Oh, I forgot that. That's great. I'm glad you remembered that. <laughs> so, and, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you now, you know, so we're, we're recording this on January 6th, 2022, which is the one year anniversary of January 6th, 2021. Yeah. And the polarization has not gotten better. Um, it's so easy to, for me, to turn, to open up the, the news and get mad and get scared and feel self-righteous and superior. And none of that does any good. It's just, you know, it's helping me feel better in the moment at the expense of actually making anything better in the real world. And so when I got your book, Make Someone's Day, it, it felt like sort of a user's manual for how to, in whatever size ways, whether it's small or large, we can't know how to re-inject civility, community and positivity. It's kind of like if we're rushing in, in the wrong direction, this is a way to sort of stop and begin to inch back towards it in a different direction. So I'm, I'm wondering, when did you start writing the book and what was what was on your mind at that point? Oh, that, that, that's great. And we can talk about today and, and, and the polarization and everything else. And I do think that it's through going back to maybe our, our roots as, as, as people, roots as a country uh, in, in the U.S., uh, where we all came together at various uh, tragic times in history. 9-11 is one of those, right? Where people weren't pointing fingers, they are giving a helping hand. And we need to get back there. So my idea for the book came from actually commuting downtown. I was at the train station early one morning, it was around 6.15, 6.30, and a woman came up to me with a clipboard, and she said, excuse me, would you sign my petition? And I said, what's it for? And took the petition from her, and she said, we're trying to get someone on the ballot for election. And I said, okay, that's a good thing. And so I'm signing, writing my name, and I said, can you tell me who this is for? 
And she told me, I said, oh, I recognize the name. I know they've been in office before. So here, I'm happy to do this. I signed it. I gave it back to her. And she paused and just looked at me with the biggest eyes, Howie. And she said to me, you made my day. I signed a petition, Howie. That's all I did. I believe <laughs> I was the first one that day for her. Maybe she, this was the first time she ever went to try to solicit um, signatures on a petition. But I thought, how could doing something so simple be so profoundly important for someone else? And I said, there's something here. Because those four words, you made my day, I believe are the most powerful compliments that one can get. And when we hear those words, talking about you ways to feel better, Howie, when we do something to, for someone where they, in the right time and in the right way, that leads them to say, you made my day, our mirror neurons shoot off as well. They respond to their positivity and we feel good. So I looked and realized there's a book here. And as I thought about it and I started writing, I realized that I've been living my life this way. But I said, this can't be an autobiography. Let me find out what else and what else is going on. So as I started researching and looking for more examples and some scientific reasoning behind it, I found a host of stories. And it's amazing, Howie, how many times the extreme stories repeat themselves. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to or met who have said, I would donate a kidney for my boss if he or she needed it. Hmm. That's not something you hear. Do, do you have a boss that you'd ever feel that way about? I don't think I have. Maybe one, but <laughs> yeah, it's not a common thing. And yet I find multiple examples. And, and so when I chose the stories to include in the book and throughout the book to help people kind of see and learn the various ways that they can do this, I chose stories that I heard numerous examples of. So it wasn't just an isolated one-time one time thing. Mm. So one of, the, one of the things I love about many of the stories in the book is that they're sort of playful and creative. So if you think about like, I'm going to make someone's day, I could, you know, certainly you know, pay them well. Um, you know, I could you know, hold the door open for someone. I could do things, but, but those things are, there's a, a, a sort of like expectation, right? That the, there, there are ways in which many of the stories that you tell defy expectation, are creative, are surprising, are playful. And it, it's almost like you can turn like, wake up in the morning and you turn and, and the world becomes this video game where your goal is to make people's day. Yes. Yes. Well, I've never thought about making a video game. Maybe that's, that's the next uh, iteration of this, Howie. That sounds uh, like a great idea, but I do think that if we can remind ourselves every morning when we wake up, what can I do today to make someone's day? Uh, it's going to work the majority of the time. I can't say it's going to work every time, but it'll work the majority of the time and you're going to feel better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so uh, my wife and I have a game where we, we go out and, you know, we'll shop at different places and there's places where it's really hard to make the people who work there smile. Mm -hmm. And so we have a competition and she almost always wins. By the way. <laughs> Where we will be walking away from the, from the checkout, and, she, and she'll be she'll start some conversational gambit with the checkout person. That frankly, like I'm cringing, like oh, that's like kind of embarrassing. Like I wouldn't go there; it's kind of scary to me. Yes. And at the end, like the person would like snort with laughter, or like even just animate, come alive after you know ten hours of check, you know, pushing the products through, you know, yeah. past the machine and right, right. Um, like it's, it's very, it's often like you have to kind of go about it in a, uh, in a sideways way. You know, like it's not obvious how to make people's day. Right. Right. Sometimes it, it, it is, uh, you've got to come out from a different perspective. So I used to remember in life when we used to travel, 
I know that that's hard for some of us who aren't traveling anywhere near the way we used to. Uh, and remember back in the day when men used to wear ties more frequently? So I used to go up, and especially when I was traveling, whether I was commuting on a train or, or flying somewhere, and I'd see someone whose tie I really liked. And I said, you've got the tie of the day. Congratulations. And inevitably, <laughs> they would laugh or smile. So it's sort of like you and your wife would try and figure out how can we get the, the disgruntled cashier to smile before we leave here? Uh-huh. I, I love that because, um, you know, one of the things my wife can do is tell women that she really likes what they're wearing or their boots or their hair or their earrings. And I don't feel like I can do that. Right. I agree. Right. I'm not I'm not old enough or sassy enough or like, I, you know, I'm sort of like a, you know, a hetero bald male potential threat. <laughs> but but to say like, oh, that's the that's the bag of the day. Right. right. Or those are the boots of the day feels like it's not it's not necessarily like a, a threatening come on. It feels very toothless and charming. Yes, yes, exactly. So maybe that's what we need to, I think everyone listening can kind of figure out what's your war of the day you want to give? Best smile or, you know, best looking coat or straightest posture. Um, there's a guy at, at my temple who's got amazing posture. Well, he's a West Point graduate, so no wonder, right? But his <laughs> posture you know, in his 60s is still, I think, is as is, is straight as is an arrow as it was probably when he was in his uh, 20s and, and going through school there. Huh. Right. And, you know, and the other thing that, that comes to me as I think about waking up in the morning and like making this my secret mission is it, it, it has to, like I can get pretty um, sorry for myself. Right. And, and, you know, compared to most people, I'm in really good shape uh, in terms of, you know, opportunity and privilege and safety and lots of things. And it doesn't that doesn't matter. Like I can still feel like, you know, things are terrible. And, you know, when I'm in conflict with someone I love, it can really get me down. Yeah. But there's something about waking up and thinking, like, how am I going to spend kindness today that puts me that, that kind of reorients me towards abundance? Because I, you know, if I had no money, I couldn't go out and give charity. Right. And if I had no, if I had no excess abundance of kindness, I couldn't share it. So it kind of reminds me that I am quite full. I love that. You know, I'm I'm going to copy that. Can I can I quote you on that? I like that abundance of kindness. That's oh, sure. a beautiful <laughs> phrase. Because we all have that in abundance. We just sometimes. We can't find the bag because we've got all those great clouds or obstacles in the way of finding it. So let's let's talk about some of the stories. And I know, you know, before we started recording, you were wondering, like, should we talk focus on personal or focus on business? And I think we should focus on the opportunities in front of us. Right. Like there, you know, wherever they are and that there's there's no domains where this doesn't apply even right. though many of us think we have to act very differently in one or the other. Yes, yes. And I think um, part of the secret to me of life is when we can be consistent in both our personal and business life, right? When we can combine the two and be the same person in both worlds, then uh, we don't have any dissonance going on within ourselves. So I think that's a great, great thought, Howie. How can we do it? Mm -hmm. Because we know it's going to help us and we know it's going to absolutely help the person we're trying to do something for. Right. So, so where, where do you find it? It's useful for people to start if, you know, for, for, I don't know, the book's been out for a few months now, right? Right. Right. So, so what do you hear from people about like how this helped them go from, you know, couch to 5k <laughs> in terms of making other people's day? Oh, my gosh. You know, I've got to tell a story that's not in the book. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll share a couple. But here's one not in the book. So here's a bonus, listeners. So if you go get the book, you're not going to find this in the book. But I was uh, – my career has been in leadership development as a leadership uh, consultant and developer and designer of certificate programs. And so one certificate program I had, I tried to find because when we've got long days and – 
long sessions and learning, I feel it needs to be broken up, right? We need to be able to do something physical. So in this one program, on one day of the program, I brought a Nike, was it Nike or Reebok? One of them, a fitness trainer. Now, I had no idea that someone like that even existed, but <laughs> but they do, and they're focused on fitness walking. So we took like a 20 or 30 minute break where she gave a little bit of a lecture about why fitness walking can be helpful and how it can make a difference in your life and just kind of get yourself moving, kind of some of the things and wellness things we were talking about earlier as well. And so uh, we then went out and the whole class went on a long walk. I was working at a graduate school and so it was around the campus. We took a long walk around campus where she kept moving back with different people and, and talking with them and kind of giving some feedback and how they were walking. And people came back to the room and felt a little energized and everything and smiling. And boy, it felt good to get out, especially on a nice day. Uh, well, six months afterwards, I believe, I got a note from someone in the class who said he's lost 35 pounds from fitness walking at work, from taking a break, and he said, and mentally, he said, I can't believe how much better I feel. So here's an example of, of something is like maybe in just an extra in a class. This really wasn't part of the, the hard curriculum, right, of leadership development. But, but it made such a difference that this person went back, applied it, and in fact did lose weight. And my gosh, did that make me feel great that I, that I included it. And here's someone who took it so seriously that he's now made it part of his lifestyle. Mm. And I know you had, you had a second story, but just to comment on, on that one, like one way to make someone's day is to tell them that they made your day. Yes. Right. Cause how often, you know, like I would, I just, um, um, watched, rewatched it's a wonderful life over over Christmas and this Perfect idea order. of we don't know the impact we have right right on other people and if other people don't tell us the impact that we have we may never know and we may have a very faulty calculation uh, so it's almost maybe one of the places to start is to tell the tell people in your life who have made your day oh my gosh so 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 let's go there and let me also say i have not estimated how often people do say, you made my day. I'm guessing about three quarters of the time people do. Um, maybe it's a little less, maybe it's a little more, but there's gonna be times where you've done something that you know you've made their day, but they just haven't said those words. That's okay. Mm -hmm. And you can do this, by the way, and we can talk about this later if you like, you can do this online. And people have then texted me afterwards, you made my day. And I, I couldn't believe it. It's like, really? Uh, so, so it's, it's amazing how this could be done, but here's a great new year's resolution for everyone listening. Here's a simple one. And that's tell someone who has made a difference in your life, how much of a difference they made. Maybe it was a teacher back in school. Maybe it was a friend or a friend's parent or a, a coach or a consultant or colleague or someone who really made a difference in your life and tell them, you know, one nice thing is there's no statute of limitations on being able to say thank you. And so when you go back and do that, not only have you made their day and, and inevitably and so frequently that people, teachers and others don't hear the difference um, that they've made to us that they really appreciate it. And whether you send them a note, call them, uh, write them, take them to lunch, whatever it might be, if you let them know what a difference they made in your life, they will be very, very gr grateful about that. And you'll have made their day. And in turn, their reaction is going to make yours. So that's a great New Year's resolution, easy to do. Just think about who's made a difference in your life, Howie, who along the way has kind of given you uh, that, that hand up when you needed it or that little inspiration or 
or just said something at the right time in the right way. And all of a sudden, this didn't just make your day, it made your life. Hmm. Anyone come to mind as I say that to you? Yeah, actually, there's a couple of teachers. And actually, I did, uh, I did my homework in advance. I, uh, in the last couple of years, I reached out, and it was hard to find one of them. It was a, a high school teacher of mine. Um, and I'm getting to the age where I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that my high school teachers are still alive. Right, right. Me too. <laughs> but he wasn't that much older than, than me. And, you know, he was, um, an English teacher who, who enjoyed my potty humor. Like I would, I would write, you know, very sort of juvenile humor, sort of, uh, Monty Python esque. Uh, Harvard Lampoon stuff that was not at all literary. And most of the teachers sort of turned up their noses and he encouraged it. He said, this is really fun. Um, and I, re I reached out to him and he's also, his also, his name is also Howard. Oh, great. Well, see, and, I, I think th there's a special bond between people named Howard. I just think so. <laughs> and I was, I was this close to being Herman. So like at, at least three times a year, I have to thank my older sister for, for going on strike against Herman. Cause I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I was a Herman. That's great. Well, I was named after, uh, after an uncle Herman. So there we go. Uh -huh. Well, I'm, I'm actually, we're, we're actually all Chaim Mendel. Ah, mm. okay. And so it could, it could have gone either way. Yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, yep. And then another was a, a college professor who's actually quite famous in, in the field of late antiquity. And oh. so he's easy to find, but I, I, I took a class with him in 1987 is the last time kind of we spoke. And I, um, I was, I'll tell you the story. I'll tell the story. Actually, Please. Cause I yeah. was, cause I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking, of who you are and what you do and, and how does that fit in? So, yeah, yeah please let us well, know. As we, as, we, as we like to say, well, that's ancient history. <laughs> oh, but I'm bummed. <laughs> so he was just the most brilliant professor. He'd written, he'd written books. He essentially created the field of late antiquity in, in, in terms of history as a study. There was sort of, you know, ancient Rome and the Middle Ages and the Dark Ages. And he said, no, there was this very vibrant period. So anyway, he was like a big deal. And to a young historian, he was, you know, I was a little awestruck. And what the last day of the fall semester was in December, um, I had to turn in a paper, but I couldn't stay for the lecture because I had to go to a funeral. And the funeral oh. was of an 11 year old boy who had oh. been in uh, a class. I was, I was paying for my, paying for my, you know, expenses by teaching Hebrew school. And this boy in my class died one day, not, not, you know, not in class, but, Thank, you know, thankfully we heard yeah. about it and yeah. I was going to the funeral. And so I, I wanted to let the professor know like why I wasn't, you know, and it was, there was no reason to let him know. It was like 300 people in the, in the lecture hall, but I did, I did want to hand in the paper on time. And then I, I, I told him, I said, I'm sorry, I have to go because it's funeral. Yeah. And he looked at me, and he said, sometimes it's the, the hardest is when we didn't really know them. And I don't know how he knew, but I really like I did not know this kid. And there were other kids that I did know I was close to. And I had I always had this sort of roiling guilt. Like, you know, like he died. I didn't know who he was. I don't know that I would have, you know, 20 kids in the class. I don't know that I, you know. And to, for him to take the time and whatever um, whatever ESP or, or intuition or genius he had to, to spend 10 seconds on that with me, like it, re it really, I can't even imagine the difference in the, the trajectory of who I've become based, based on that one sentence. What a mensch, what a beautiful thing to say. Truly, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So, uh, so I did. I did reach out to both of them. And, oh, good. Uh, but now, but now, now I'm excited to like open the notebook and and go back down memory lane and think of more.
Sure, absolutely. Uh, I I had the um, rare privilege of being able to do something for, for my mom. My dad had passed away uh, long ago. And uh, someone asked me, a friend of mine, who uh, was chief learning officer at Becton Dickinson at the time, and said he and his wife are putting a book together called uh, Leadership Lessons from Our Mothers. Mm. What did we learn from our mother? And and he was he and I were on the uh, Association for Talent Development board together. And I had brought my mom to a couple of those board meetings because I would bring her. Uh, we, we'd travel to the meeting and then we'd go kind of sightsee and have fun af after the meeting. So he actually knew her. And he said, Howard, I'd really like you to tell a story about your mom. And so I was thinking about th there are a lot of things to, to say about her. But she was a she was the sports fan in the family. My my dad was not, but she was. <laughs> and so I wrote an essay called Mom Taught Me the Score. And it wasn't just the score in sports, but the score in life. And uh, uh and that was accepted in the book, and I'm I'm pleased to say that it made it. And uh when the book came out, I read it to her on Mother's Day. Oh. Wow. Uh, so I got to ask, Cubs or White Sox? Cubs, North Siders. Okay, <laughs> that was that, that. That was easy. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the teams on the field. Um, I think these days I probably support the Sox more than the Cubs because they're in some type of a rebuilding phase. No, none of us here know what it is because they've just dismantled the team and um, they've got twenty nine and thirty year old rookies playing and. And who knows what's going to happen? But, but yeah, lifelong Cubs fan. Okay, I'm, I'm guessing you were the only person in the city who wasn't mad at Steve Bartman. <laughs> I didn't think it was Steve Bartman's fault. Yeah, was, <laughs> I, I think, and, and the Cubs have reconciled with him. By the way, for those of you listening who don't know, uh, Moises Alou, this was in in, in the. Um, uh, Final game of, of the playoffs that would have gotten the Cubs into the World Series. And Moises Alou was our left fielder, and he ran over uh, to the stands to try to snare a foul ball. This wasn't going to be the last out, but maybe it was the uh, last out in the eighth. And instead, a fan interfered trying to grab the ball, as most fans do, right? We want to lunge and catch a foul ball. And uh, the person's name was Steve Bartman, and he just became um, – roasted in uh, throughout Chicago to the point that he was, I think, a season ticket holder, and he did not go to Wrigley Field again for, for a while until they invited him back and said, we know it wasn't your fault that we didn't, we didn't win that game because that just sort of opened the gate for, for a couple other Cubs flubs, which they were so uh, uh, noted for. Prior to the 2016 uh, delight of uh, World Series win, um, and and so they'd made peace with him. But I I didn't think it was his fault per se. I thought, boy, why did we suck after that? You know, Joe, <laughs> Joe Madden was right when he said, "Try not to suck," because the Cubs have spent a history of sucking. <laughs> Right. And I, I don't know if this is true, but I heard I heard what happened to that baseball. Yeah. You know, yes. do you know about this? Yes. Yes. Harry Carey's restaurant bought it and blew it up. I heard, I heard they made it into soup. <laughs> I don't like they, think they made it to soup, but but they certainly got got thoroughly shredded. Okay. I heard I heard that they took off the leather and they boiled it and. Uh... <laughs> so my you know, my vegan my vegan listeners would have a dilemma whether to eat, whether to have that soup if it had a <laughs> horse eyed right horse a baseball yeah uh, right. right so you said there was a second story that was wasn't in the book um this this is a, an amazing story that's going to touch touch uh, I think it's going to touch everyone um, and and this is about a, a thirteen year old boy. In Mississippi, this is recent, uh, and he had got some type of a uh, cancer, uh, 
where he needed a bone marrow transplant. And he got the bone marrow transplant. So there's, there's good news there. He was able to receive it. And, uh, but because he was going through the treatment afterwards, he qualified for a make a wish, uh, make a wish mm. opportunity. And so he didn't hesitate when make a wish contacted him. And, you know, the majority of kids who get make a wish, you know, it's Disneyland, right? I want to go to Disneyland or Disney World or um, do this or that. You know what he wanted to do? He wanted to feed the homeless. Mm. That was his wish. And so, and it's the first time that the Make-A-Wish Foundation in Mississippi ever got a request um, from a kid to help others. And mm. so they said, we will provide meals for 80 people once a month for a year. And, um, and, and this kid uh, started a foundation to be able to raise money afterwards to continue to feed people. His name was Elijah and they called it Elijah's Table. And it is just so remarkable. And the people who he fed were so touched and grateful and he got so many notes of thanks and he said i just think it's not right that some people should go up, go to bed hungry mm -hmm. what a beautiful beautiful thing that he could get you know it's like a genie right if, if we got a genie in the bottle and you got one wish what could it be that's what make a wish i think is right it's that genie <laughs> in the bottle well gee i want to meet the president or i want to meet this or i want to do that and his was, I want to feed the homeless. How could you not mm. be moved by that? Mm. And of course, the, you know, the beautiful irony is that that's probably the most selfish thing he could have done, right? In terms of his own happiness. Say more. Selfish thing he could have done? You mean selfish Yeah, like if, 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 if he wanted to maximize his own happiness. Yes. Yeah. Right. Like Disney World would have been fun for a day. Absolutely. Memories for a week. But like, you know, I've seen studies about um, giving giving people money and giving them the instruction to buy something for themselves or buy something from someone else. And then they ask, you know, how happy did the experience make you? And it's off the charts. How much more we enjoy helping others. Yes. Than, than doing things for ourselves. So that's what yes. I meant by self. Like if you really, if you really care about your own happiness paramount, you will act like, you know, you will, you will give away. Right. You will, you will be generous. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And what a gr great thing. And this was just, he was just diagnosed last year. And so, or maybe it was the year before and, and it was past years when, when they, uh, donations started happening but god you know 13 14 years old i, I can't imagine yeah and, and you know you can see, like when you think about the the spirits in the world who are making such a huge difference i think you know i think a lot about uh, greta thunberg yes. who um who did something so small and simple Right. She, she stood outside school on Friday with a sign and she just did it every single day. And like you could, you know, you could imagine any, you know, people doing something that small and it going nowhere. But yet there's something like we re we recognize when a spirit calls out for greatness in us. And she's become, right. you know, probably the most prominent climate activist in the world, certainly the best known certainly the one with the greatest um, moral standing and following right um so like i i i wanted to say like we can do little things but we have no idea if they're going to be little right right that's so true isn't it um and, and that's what happens is things start small so in the book you know we've we've talked about how how the pandemic has shaped us uh, mm. and, and changed us. And, uh, I tell a story about making someone's day in times of crisis. And so for me, the crisis that we've all faced the last couple of years is the pandemic and how this changed us. So 
here's a kid from the University of Alabama coming home to his home, happens to be in a Chicago suburb of Orland Park. Maybe that's how I saw and heard the story in the first place, because because it was uh, on the local news. And he decided that, hey, me and my friends are bored. We'll be happy to go out and shop for you or pick up prescriptions for anyone who can't get out of the house because they just don't feel safe. Mm. This was at the start of the uh, pandemic when, when we didn't know what was going on and, and, and everyone just was kind of trying to figure out what to do. And he created this uh, group that he called Leave It to Us. And would you believe that 35 chapters of Leave It to Us have been founded around the country where college kids um, go out and they help others who don't have, uh, who can't get out or, or afraid to get out to get their prescriptions and, and, and food? Um, I think that's great. I mean, I know they're delivery services, so it's not like there weren't other ways that they could get it done. But how cool that he did it uh, and organized this and insisted that they take no money uh, for doing the service. Mm. Yeah, it's so interesting, you know, in this in this world in which virality is kind of a, a an obsession. Like, how can I get this thing to go viral, whether it's my TikTok or, right. you know, this offer to, you know, or the book that I just wrote? Um and the things that so a lot, I mean, a lot of it is, is, you know, engineered and there's a lot about social media that is very worrisome and suspect, but there's also people who are just going out and not trying to go viral, but just inspiring others. Right. Like I just, yes. I just, uh, I just heard about, I was on the you know, New York times website a couple months ago and I heard about this Facebook group that started somewhere and has now been replicated thousands of times called by nothing the yes. name of your town yes and so i joined it and i've you know i've given away stuff and uh my wife just came home today with a set of oil paints that someone wasn't going to use and she's an artist and she's thrilled with it and you know there's no money no expectations no guilt a lot like you no know, another group that we're, that we're both part of yes. and how just you know how nice things can go viral and spread almost as easily as, you know, crap. Yes, absolutely. And I've got some stories about buy nothing in the book. We got a good yeah. one that comes to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Here, here's the simple one is, is Maureen was um, cleaning up her house and she had an old easel that was really um, dirty and, and, and bent and everything. She thought, well, before I throw it out, let me see if anybody wants it. And so she posted it on Buy Nothing. Well, a woman who didn't have a lot of money came and she said, I'd love to fix this up for my daughter because my daughter ends up having to paint on her kitchen table and has to move everything, of course, every time that they sit down for a meal, but doesn't have an easel or anything. So uh, she took the easel and sent Maureen a picture how she fixed it up. It looked like better than new and gave it to her daughter for Christmas. And her daughter said, this is the greatest Christmas gift I've ever gotten. Mm. Well, how, how amazing, right? How, how simple as you say something that Maureen was, was going to throw out or didn't know what to do. She, she also had this with a um, old artificial Christmas tree. And was uh, didn't know what to do with that. And posted on buy nothing, and a family which couldn't afford a Christmas tree took it, and it just made their holiday. So, yeah, there are lots of ways of simply doing things uh, for others. Um, almost, almost like what's it called? Um, the muda, the the waste stream that that we don't use, uh, and all of a sudden, you know. It can be used for something. It can be used for good. And don't just throw it out without first thinking about who might be able to need this, use this, how you can donate this, um, what you can do. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's beautiful. And it allows you to sort of look at everything around you as a resource. I was just reading an article today in the Washington Post about the, the headline was, these houses are made out of garbage and they're they're climate resilient. Yes, yes, I saw that. 
So, and they're talking about earth ships, which are this type of housing that was started in Taos, New Mexico, that's basically made out of garbage, right? Out of old tires, car tires yes. and truck tires filled with sand, which is incredibly strong, incredibly insulating. Um, and so to, you know, to look at to look at what, what's wrong around us and see, you know, you know, it's only wrong because it's out of context. Like everything could be right in, in a context. And so, you know, creating, envisioning systems in which things work the way they're supposed to work or work the way they could work or work the way that, that aids all the elements of the system. Um, yes. Right, because I, I know I I tend to look at things from a very negative perspective. Like, uh, you know, like when you mentioned Nike earlier, like the chatter in my head immediately goes to all the things I don't approve of about Nike. Right. Yes. And yes. and I don't want to diminish like my 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 ethical standards or say that I you know I some, but there's a way in which that orientation ends up helping no one. Right. Right. And, and least of all, it doesn't impact the company the way you'd like to have an impact on the company, right? You want yeah. to change. And I think she was a just just to set the record straight. I think she was a Reebok master trainer, but Nike is the first thing that came to me, and uh -huh. I realized afterwards, no, it was Reebok she did it for. But but still, I I totally get it. I totally uh, understand what what you're saying and how we can turn things around. I've got so many more simple ways that this can be done. As I say, you can do it online, and there are lots of even opportunities. I, in my chapter on how you can do this uh, um, for people who are more introverted or don't want to have that face-to-face -face contact today, um, I give a list of a number of places you can donate to that make a difference in the lives of kids and the lives of others and the lives of, of movements and causes and, and just simple things you can do that can make a difference. Um, even sending cards, you know, all sorts of stories about sending cards to people at, at um, nursing homes and, and hospital wards and stuff who, who don't have anyone. And just even getting a card that says, thinking about you and wishing you well. It doesn't have to mm. say anything more than that. And that provides such a lift for others. And again, it's not something that they you're going to hear back, oh, that card made my day. But it's certainly something easy and simple to do um, that does uh, have that type of an effect. Mm. And, you know, and possibly one of the side effects of working at this of becoming a make make someone's day specialist is that you gain <laughs> faith that when you don't hear back that you know that we you know if we're just doing it for the recognition and approval it becomes very transactional right it yes. can be like you know well i i did a favor for that person and uh, they didn't say thank you so to hell with them right right as as opposed to um you know, I'm I'm overflowing, and I can't control where I overflow as long as I as long as I overflow. Right, right. I, you know, I I know there are times when we do things for others, and we say, "Wait a second, when am I getting mine?" You know, where where do I find mine? You know, how how do I? What are people going to do things for me? And I realize that that's the wrong attitude because if we keep looking for something, it's like waiting for that phone call. I don't know if you remember, you know, applying for, for your first jobs or something and, and you're staring at the phone and you've sent out a bunch of resumes and waiting and it's like, okay, phone ring. You're going to ring. I know it's going to ring and, and you're mm -hmm. waiting and waiting and it doesn't ring. And it's, it's the same thing. You do something kind and you say, well, wait a second. When's somebody going to do something for me? Well, it's going to happen. I can't tell you when, but it will happen. And, probably when you least expect it or least think about it. So it doesn't mean that, you know, just because someone's not kind to you right away doesn't mean that you can't be kind or do something for others that makes their day. Because again, just by doing it, you're going to feel better. And that's the bottom line. We want us, we want to help others and be great to feel better in the process.
Mm. Yeah, and I think it's also important to distinguish between making someone's day and, you know, becoming the giving tree, right? The, yes, yes. Like, like un, un, you know, boundaryless self-sacrifice. Because I know a lot yes. of people, you know, these days feel like I'm just giving to everyone and and it's too much and it and when you overgive it it uh, comes with a side of of resentment often well and and frankly depletion as well you don't want to deplete yourself just by because you want to give so much uh so you do need to balance that thanks Howie. it's it's a good realization that make someone stay when you're up and able to do that and if right now is not the time then maybe you take a take a day or a few days off from doing that to kind of replenish your own soul and ability mm. to make someone's day. Right. Um, so you write a fair amount in the book about work, right? So how, how do, how do we think about, so if, you know, let's say we're, we're a manager or a leader. Um, how do we think about making people's day as opposed to hitting numbers setting, you know, setting an example, holding people accountable. Where's, where's the, where's the magic there? So here's how here's the magic right now. We're hearing all about the great migration. It's people are leaving uh, their organizations in droves. And, and we know they leave for a couple reasons. One reason is, is their boss. Uh, another reason is uh, today is that it doesn't meet their needs or their comfort level given the pandemic. So what can we do to help retain people? What can we help do to help motivate, inspire them? What can we do to get to increase their productivity, but also to increase their commitment uh, to who we are and what we do? And so when you make someone's day as a boss, uh, you become a boss who's really uh, appreciated and who people want to commit and do more for. So a couple quick stories on the, on on that and ways to do that. Uh, and it it can be it can be so simple that people don't even realize how and how they're doing it or what they're doing about it. So so here's um just just a couple of stories. So this one says just some bosses are full of inspiration. Dave's best boss had this magic where he could just make you feel like you could do absolutely anything. It's kind of like how Marshall makes us feel, right, Howie? Um, mm. He instilled confidence like no one I've ever known. There's a lot of lip service every day to be a team player. But the, at the risk of sounding trite, he had a way of making you feel like you are an important, integral part of the team. What you mattered to, what you did mattered to him and to the company. I don't have any idea how he did it. No effusive compliments, no empty praise, no weekly luncheons or gift cards. When he said, thank you, I could have done it without you. You just knew he meant it. He cared and trusted his employees and he was honest and genuine with us. And as a result, Dave became deeply loyal to his boss and was so moved and motivated by him that he said, I haven't worked for him in years, but if he, he's one of the ones, but if he needed a kidney, I'd see if I was a match. Hmm. Uh, another story about uh, someone uh, boss at a legal firm. So someone was a new, uh, um, I believe a paralegal at a legal services firm and worked for an attorney. And in the second day of work, uh, she realized afterwards she made a mistake that, that she shouldn't have done. And so she went and effusively apologized to her boss. You know what her boss said? Her boss said, I don't believe people make mistakes on purpose. They make mistakes because of poor instructions by their boss. So the fault is not yours. It's mine for not being clear and making sure that you understood exactly what was needed. So please don't feel the blame yourself. The blame is all on me. Mm -hmm. These these are bosses that are that are uh, truly remarkable. You know, you and I both both know and have heard the story uh, about Hubert Jolie, right? Who came over and <laughs> CEO and both, in training, right? Yeah, exactly. When he took over Best Buy to try to turn them around, 
He got a badge that said CEO in training, went to the middle of the country, St. Cloud, Minnesota, worked there for a week. And the biggest thing he did was he put himself in the shoes of, of the associates that worked there, the security guards that worked there, the cashiers that worked there, and the customers that came in. And after a week, he went back and knew what needed to happen to turn Best Buy around because he believed in the people and what they were doing. And, you know, most new CEOs were trying to turn things around. Let's slash headcount. Let's close doors. That's the quickest way to make a profit. And he said, let's believe in the people we have. Mm. So what this is bringing to mind is another Washington Post story that you may, you may have seen as well from uh, yesterday about um, NPR's problem holding on to hosts who come from uh, marginalized backgrounds. So um, in the past few week. I think uh, Audi Cornish just announced she's leaving. Lulu Garcia oh. Navarro left. Uh, Michelle Norris, Noel King, and what, what you know, the reporter was hearing these um, sort of hearing from people saying, "We, you know, oh, since so some someone, so some NPR spokesperson was saying, well, the world is opened up. There's all these deep pocketed podcasters, and they're just poaching our talent." And what they heard from internally was people leave because they don't feel valued and they don't feel they feel like, OK, you 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 hired us partly to expand the audience, but you don't give us the power to do anything. And we and so thinking about when you're talking about like what a great boss would do, it doesn't cost any money to make someone to make a great broadcaster or a, um, a journalist at NPR feel empowered to tell their stories why they're there. And yet it right. appears that it's not happening. Interesting. Well, let me go to the Washington Post because I love this story. And I spoke to the managing editor of the Washington Post, uh, Tracy Grant, about this, that the executive editor of the Washington Post several years ago was Marty Barron. And Marty uh, started receiving notes and letters, like all of a sudden, lots of them from readers who were truly moved by articles that they read in the post, and they wanted the staff to know. And so Marty's reading these, and he said, these thank you notes aren't for me. They're for all the people out there on the, on, uh, on the floor, all the people out there in the press room all the people out there getting the stories and getting things printed. So he started taking these thank you notes and displaying them outside his office so people could come over and see it. I've called it, I don't know if they do, but I've called it the wall of gratitude. And it's the appreciation from all these readers that they've never met. And certainly, um, you know, in the past several years, reporters have gotten really beaten, beaten down upon. And so when one of the journalists needs a lift, they would go over to the wall of gratitude and they would read, uh, read some of these notes and, and just feel uplifted and moved. And when even the reporters had to go when they closed the press room, um, when the pandemic was at its height, um, many of them took pictures of their favorite thank you note. And so when they felt the need to be inspired, as they're working uh, out of their homes, they would go ahead and take a look at that picture of the note to help pull them up. Mm. Doesn't cost mm. Marty anything, but what what great impact it has on the people who worked at the Post. All right. So I'm remembering I uh, interviewed Chris Voss, who wrote uh, a wonderful book on negotiation called Never Split the Difference. And he has all these you know, tricks for you, know, basically getting what you want. So in a sense, you could say it's a very sort of self-serving book. But he like points out like there's places where like, you know, at airports where almost everyone feels unappreciated and at best and vilified at worst. And we've seen, you know, over the past two years, uh, you know, human behavior at during travel is just getting, you know, more and more fraught. And it's like, if you want to change your flight or you want to upgrade or you want a different seat, like start by just being a human being to people 
and commenting, boy, you know, your your job, it seems so hard, it's so important, or how are things going today? And, you know, it, it, it occurred to me it's at a certain point, like, I didn't just have to do that when I wanted something. <laughs> right? Like, I could I could do it without needing anything. And it was even, you know, I sometimes I would just get without even asking for something, people would, um, you know, do me favors just because I had been a human being to them. Like the, 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 the floor is pretty yeah. low. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And we can all start there, right? All we can do is be there and, and, and just be ourselves, be, be kind to others who don't get that sort of, uh, appreciation all the time. It's, Saying thank you costs nothing. Smiling at someone costs nothing. You know, when you smile, the more you smile, believe it or not, you lose weight when you smile. I can't believe that, but you do. <laughs> you do lose weight when you smile more. So, so why not? Why not say a kind word? Whether it's the cashier, as we started with, or someone at the airport, a worker, a, a, a flight attendant, uh, someone at the gate. Just, just be kind, be, be nice, make their day. And believe me, they're going to go ahead and make yours. Mm. That's a, yeah, that's a great place for us to, to wrap up. And I want to make sure people know how to find your book. If someone wants to, to um, engage with you around leadership development at their organization, or if people just want to say thank you for making their day today, how can they find out more? Oh, that's great. Thanks, Howie. Uh, simple way is uh, howardhprager.com. Go ahead and reach out to me there on my website. Sign up and I'll keep you updated as to what's going on with, uh, with Make Someone's Day and, and the book and where things are going. Uh, you can also find the book at any online bookstore uh, that you like to go to, uh, Walmart, Target, Barnes & Noble, Amazon, of course, they've all got it. Um, or you can ask your bookstore to order it because it's orderable and uh, they'll get it in for you. So uh, please go ahead and do that. And please reach out to me. I'd love to hear from you and hear uh, how this might have made your day and maybe what stories you have to share. Because all of us have a story where this has happened at least once. And I'll bet mm. we have it many times if we think about it. Uh-huh. I just want to say, like, your your book is kind of like a compendium of stories and a lot of a lot of the people who who have given you stories I recognize their names and I know a lot of them are first names only and I think I know who they are um but it seems it it felt like like the writing of this book must have been tremendously fun um I'd say yes so 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 the first answer is oh of course Howie lots of fun it took me 5 <laughs> years to write the book so I'm not uh -huh. sure it was fun all the time. And when I went back to edit it over and over, I'm not sure that was fun all the time, but I'm so glad I got it out. I'm so glad I put it out. I'm so glad to be here and be able to talk to you and your listeners about how easy, how important it is, and how it will help not only others, but make you feel good as well. Awesome. Awesome. So what um, and just for people who are who are listening and not uh, reading the show notes, your last name is spelled P-R-A-G-E-R. That is correct. And and you'll find it with my middle initial Howard H. Prager, P-R-A-G-E-R. Mm. Can you can you share what the second H is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the second H is Henry. So uh, I am, uh, I, I'm also a Chaim, by the way, um, but I'm a Howard Henry, uh, I'm named after a great uncle and, uh, and my grandfather. Nice. Nice. And yeah, for people who are you. watching this on video, I think I'm going to present it uh, widescreen, so full aspect, so people can see the, uh, the large brass object behind you. Can you say, say a word yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been a tuba player uh, most of my life. I absolutely love it. And so I thought as I was uh, creating my my home office when I realized I'm going to be here for, for quite a while, and I said, you know, what the heck? I'm going to bring up my sousaphone and be able to just 
take a break sometimes and just just play it for for pleasure. I was um, playing it actually every day um, for the last two years for my mom, playing just a few songs for her every day to just pick her up when she was isolated, not able to get out. So I decided hmm. just to keep it part of my life and keep it closer to me. Nice. Nice. You're, you're all about that bass. <laughs> <laughs> it is all about that bass. You are right. <laughs> awesome. Well, Howard Prager, Howard Henry Prager, thank you so much for writing this book, for being generous with your time with me today, and for the spirit that you just, uh, you know, emanate that ripples out into the world. I can feel it in myself, and I know it's going to. Uh, go far beyond that. So I really appreciate it. Great. Thanks, Howie. It's always a pleasure seeing you and talking to you. And it's a pleasure to share these stories with your listeners. And I look forward to their stories so that I can continue to uh, let others know ways that they can make someone stay. Awesome. Well, we'll, we'll get it done. Thanks again. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye now. Bye.